Today's video is a compilation of the most tragic mountaineer deaths in the Himalayas narrated on this channel so far. The video will include the stories of unfortunate mountaineers who died on Everest, K2, and other famous peaks of the world's highest mountain range. Let's get started. Pietri Moroski was born in Warsaw on 27 December 1976. He was an only child born to a chemist's father and a photo lab technician mother. Pietr would go on to become a doctor of chemistry with a passion for photography and mountain climbing. Pietr Morawski had many achievements to his name as he had summited six eight thousanders during his mountaineering career. In 2001, he climbed Chang Tengri and in 2002, he attempted to climb Peak Pobody but failed to reach the summit. But this would only be the beginning of his career. In 2005, Pietro Mawaski completed the first ever winter climb of the Shisha Pangman history. That was a great accomplishment and showed how far he had come as a mountaineer. In the next few years, Pietro successfully climbed the Nanga Parbat, Gashabram 1, Gashabram 2, and a solo climb of the Broad Peak. All of these successful climbs spoke volumes about his mountaineering experience and dedication. He was a leading figure of the younger Polish mountaineering community. In 2001, Pietr Morawski attempted a new expedition. The main goal of the expedition was to climb the west face of Manaslu. This would have been an attempt at a new route for climbing Manaslu, the 8,163 meters high, eighth highest mountain in the world. Pietr did not set out on this mission alone. He was part of a two-man team with his partner, Peter Hamor. Peter Hamor and Pietr were close friends. They had climbed together for years, summoning Cho Oyu, Nanga Parbat, Gashabram 1, and Gashabram 2 together as a team. Peter was a highly accomplished climber, with 14 8,000 peaks climbed on his record and seven summits of the summit of the Earth's summit conquered. Needless to say, both climbers made an incredible team together. But before Pietri could attempt the climb of Manaslu alongside his partner, he needed to acclimatize his body to the high altitudes. For this, he chose to do an acclimatization climb of Dalugiri. Dalugiri is the seventh highest mountain in the world, standing at an astounding 8,167 meters. All of Dalugiri is located in Nepal, making it the highest mountain located within a single country. Ever since it was first climbed on 13 May 1960, people from around the world come to successfully summit this natural wonder. Dalugiri is a unique mountain due to its almost sudden rise from the surrounding terrain. It is also one of the most dangerous mountains to climb with a fatality rate of 16.2% in 2007. But despite these challenges, Pietr Morawski was determined to finish his acclimatization climb successfully so he could go on to summit Manaslu via the new route and memorialize his name in the mountaineering history. The acclimatization climb began very well. As planned, Pietr started his climb of Dalugiri using the normal route at the base camp. He reached Camp 1 and Camp 2 without any problems, all thanks to his years of mountaineering experience. This was as far up as he intended to go for the acclimatization. It was time to make his way down. After a long trek, Pietri successfully reached back down to Camp 1, but tragedy struck as he continued his voyage downwards. At around 5,500 meters below Camp 1, on his way to base camp, Pietri found himself climbing over a snow bridge. A snow bridge is an arc of snow that forms over a crevice on a mountain. Sometimes, this arc completely covers a crevice, deceiving climbers into thinking they are walking on solid ground. The particular snow bridge Pietr was climbing stretched over an approximate 25 meter deep gap. Only snow was holding him up over a great fall. Mid-journey, over this deceivingly large snow bridge, Pietr suddenly felt the ground below him give way. The snow bridge had collapsed. Pietri had fallen inside the deep crevice, 5,500 meters above sea level, on one of the most dangerous mountains in the world. The Polish mountain rescue expedition, operating on Dalugiri at that time, began rescue attempts as soon as the news reached them. However, this would prove futile since a 20 meters fall had proved fatal for Pietri Morawski. Peter Homor, Justina Szczepinik, and a TOPR team extracted the body of Pietri Morawski from the crevice. Resuscitation attempts were unsuccessful, and the doctor pronounced him dead. In accordance with his will, his body was lowered into a 5,700-meter ice crevice on April 13, 2009, in the Himalayas. 
During this ceremony, close friends and climbers were present, including Peter Hamor, Justina Shekspinik, and Gregors Bargill, Edward Lakota, and Andrik Minkler. Petri now rests in the mountains he loves so much. He would later be awarded the Knight's Cross of the Order of Polonia, Restituta, by President Lech Kaczynski for his contribution to the development of Polish Himalayan mountaineering. There is also a plaque of commemorating him at the Church of St. Antony Podeski. The death of mountaineer Milan Sedlacek is one of the most tragic in the history of Czech mountaineering. Milan Sedlacek, born in 1961, had previously summited Sis Pagma. He had also attempted to climb K2 twice, but both attempts were unsuccessful. After that, he attempted to climb Lhotse, but the attempt had to be stopped due to avalanches and bad weather after Milan reached 7,800 meters. So in 2012, Milan was ready to make a second attempt to achieve his dream of summoning Lhotse. Lhotse is the fourth highest mountain in the world, reaching a staggering 8,516 meters in height. It is part of the Himalayas, and its main summit was first climbed in 1956 by a Swiss team. An expedition to climb Lhotse is a grueling task since it takes four to six weeks to climb, and the success rate is only 67%. Despite the difficulty, Milan had always desired to summit Lhotse. Now at the age of 51, he had joined his second expedition to fulfill his dream. The leader of the party was Leopold Solovsky, a well-respected expert mountaineer. Leopold was the first ever Czech to summit Everest, giving him a legendary status in the community. Other members of the team included Radovan Marek and Pavel Lubtak, all highly capable climbers. With such a qualified party, it seemed nothing could go wrong. But then, complications arose. On 1st May, a rocky avalanche hit the base camp of Pavel Lubtak, injuring his arm. For him, the expedition had ended as he was transferred via helicopter to a hospital in Kathmandu. The expedition had to continue without him. During the climb, strong winds and falling rocks presented a serious threat to Milan's team. Eventually, the expedition, including Milan Sedlacek, reached the fourth high altitude camp at 7,800 meters without any incidents. Now, all that was left was to summit Lhotse, and Milan was excited to finally stand at Lhotse's top. But this is where the real trouble would begin. The last 300 meters of the Lhotse summit route are extremely dangerous. This portion of the climb consists of a steep, rock-filled gully with frequent dangerous rockfalls. But Milan was determined and confident that he would reach the summit. Late in the evening, Radovan Marek first began his climb to the summit, with Milan starting out second behind him. Radovan Marek reached the top of Lhotse. After reveling in the beauty up on the summit of Lhotse, Marek started his journey back. It was on his way back, just a measly 50 meters short of the summit that Marek saw Milan making his way up. According to Marek, the conditions of these last few meters were pretty bad. A climb would take an hour. Zvidri, you can't make it. Be careful, he advised Milan Sedlacek. But Milan was determined to finish the climb. He was so close to reaching the summit he had longed for. Radovan Marek again tried to persuade Milan to stop, but Milan told him he had the strength to finish the climb. Radovan believed him since Milan was an experienced climber. Radovan himself was extremely tired, and if he stopped now, he would freeze to death. He couldn't wait any longer, convincing Milan to stop his ascent. So, he continued down his path to the fourth high altitude camp. This was the last time Milan was seen alive. Radovan waited at the fourth high altitude camp for Milan, having no doubt that his friend would make it back. The next day, he went down to camp three. Leopold, the leader of the expedition, had been awaiting both Radovan and Milan since the previous day. Now that Radovan had arrived with no sign of his partner in the morning, Milan's situation had started to look grim. Despite the two hoping for his return, Milan did not make it back. Neither of them could make the journey back to aid and rescue Milan. Coming down from such a great height, exhaust your body, it would take at least five days for them to recover enough strength to attempt a climb. A rescue attempt in their current state would surely mean their own death. At the top of Lhotse, everyone is on their own, including Milan. The climbers wanted to declare Milan missing in the hopes that he was still alive despite the odds. But later, a team of Indians climbed up the peak of Lhotse and found Milan, sitting just a bit below the peak, frozen to death. 
he had died on his way back from the summit. According to Sena Nakubri, chairman of the Czech Mountaineering Association, Milan died of exhaustion on his way back. It is not clear whether he collapsed or some other complication arose that prevented him from climbing down further. In the words of Leopold Solovsky, the leader of the expedition, the desire for the top is sometimes greater than the desire to return down. Milan's body could not be retrieved by the team that found him. All they could do was take a picture as proof. The rough weather and dangerous terrain make it very difficult to retrieve the bodies of climbers who pass away near Lotzi summit. The only solace that could be found was in the fact that, in the end, at the age of 50, Milan did reach the summit of Lotzi and fulfilled his greatest desire of climbing Lotzi. Simone Laterra was a 31-year-old Italian alpinist. He was known for summiting five of the 8,000ers between 2006 and 2011. Shisha Pangma, Broad Peak, Kashabram 2, Cho Oyu, and Manaslu had summited them all. And in 2018, he was ready to attempt his second climb of Dalugiri, his sixth 8,000er, standing at 8,167 meters. For this climb, he was part of the team of 15 led by Catalina Quesada Castro. This summoning attempt was to be done without supplementary oxygen, which would be a taxing feat on Simone's body. So to prepare himself for the arduous task, Simone wanted to acclimatize to the high altitudes by ascending the northeastern ridge of Dalugiri. On April 28th, Simone started the acclimatization climb with Valdi Kovalevsky at his side. The climb went well, and the duo reached the 6,976 meters mark. At this point, Simone decided to pitch his camp and stop his climb. Valdi, on the other hand, decided to continue up to pitch his tent at a higher altitude, so he could be better prepared for the upcoming summoning attempt. At 1 p.m., Simone contacted Paul Michalski at the base camp. The climb had him tired, and he was coughing. Simone told Powell that he was camped at a steep and narrow spot, but the camp is attached to a fixed rope using a harness. He told Powell that his legs were dangling over the edge. He got reprimanded by Powell for pitching his tent there. During the whole conversation, Alex Gavon, another accomplished climber, listened close by. At around 5 p.m., an attempt was made to communicate with Simone, but the call went unanswered. However, this was not taken as something too worrisome since contact had been lost in the mountains for various reasons, but Powell had a bad feeling. On April 29th, the next day, Powell and Gavon decided to make their way to Camp 1. Then, at around 10 a.m., a Spanish climber came down from Camp 2 and talked to Powell. Gavon heard a chilling statement by the Spanish climber as he said, Powell, I think Simone is dead. Just minutes later, Valdi also arrived and recounted that tragedy had struck. After Valdi had left Simone the previous day to pitch his tent higher up, the wind on the mountain started to pick up. Valdi had to anchor himself using a harness and pitch his tent in the strong wind. But just a while later, the wind slammed against his tent, breaking it. He had to leave in a hurry, fearing for his life. Valdi descended to Simone's camp for refuge, where he would find him resting inside. They had a short conversation, and Simone began to arrange the insides of the tent to make room for Valdi to enter and rest. Simone outside gets busy, clearing out the snow from the entrance of the tent so he can enter. While they were both doing their task, something unfortunate happened. A sudden gust of wind hit the tent, making it swell like a sail. The tent was being pushed away from the ground. In the blink of an eye, the tent had been blown away over the ridge, with Simone still inside. The last words Simone ever spoke to Valdi were, No, no, no. Simone and his tent disappeared into the gaping void. According to Valdi, it all happened so fast that he couldn't react in time to grab the tent. Afterwards, Valdi stood there, shocked at the events that had just transpired. He considered going down Simone's fall line in search of him, but the harsh wind and the snow blowing around him made it impossible. His only option was to descend down to Camp 2, where he met four Spanish climbers. He informed them of the incident, and they delivered the unfortunate news to the base camp. Valdi spent the night at Camp 2, and the next morning he descended to Camp 1 to tell Powell and Gavon of the tragic incident. The expedition team knew that even though the chances were slim, it was still possible that Simone was alive. 
With this hope in mind, a rescue mission was mounted. A helicopter was requested, but due to the extremely bad weather conditions that Dalogiri is prone to, it had to be landed for the night. On the morning of April 30th, the rescue attempt would finally begin as the weather cleared up. The helicopter was deployed with a search party and the rescue mission began. At around 6,000 meters, the rescue team saw a red object. Upon landing, it was identified as an article of Simone's clothing, but Simone was nowhere to be seen. The search continued. After a while, the rescue team spotted a small black object, barely visible in the snow under a Ciroc. Upon getting a closer look, the object was identified as Simone's body. Simone had died from the fall. After a day of being out in the extremely cold weather of Dalgiri, his body had frozen to the ground. The objective was now to recover the body, but this would prove to be very difficult due to the constant threat of the Ciroc toppling over. Eventually, thanks to the efforts of the rescue team, Simone's body was retrieved. In the 2018 spring climbing season in the Himalayas, Simone Laterra was a first casualty. He was an inspiration for many Italian mountaineers and his legacy lives onwards with his family and friends in the mountaineering community. Born on February 2, 1949, Yasuko Namba was a climbing enthusiast and a businesswoman. She traveled all over the world and summited Kilimanjaro, Aconcagua, Denali, and Mount Elbrus. After summoning Vincent Massif in 1993, and Karsten's Pyramid in 1994, she was ready to take on her next big challenge, the tallest mountain in the world, standing at 8,848.86 meters, Mount Everest. By this point, Yasuka Namba was very experienced in mountain climbing, and she was known to be a very determined woman. So, the unwieldy and difficult to climb Mount Everest seemed to be the perfect next addition to her mountaineering career. Yasuko was part of a group expedition, including Andy Harris and Michael Groom. Their team was led by Rob Hall, an expert climber. Alongside them was another team of climbers, attempting to summit Everest with Scott Fisher as her leader. With such highly experienced and qualified climbers leading the expedition, it seemed like nothing would go wrong. The trek to the summit of Everest went well for the climbers. Yasuko Namba reached the top, becoming the oldest woman to summit Everest at the time. She also became the second woman to reach the seven summits. But the tragedy would strike as a party made its way back to camp after having accomplished the greatest desire of summoning the tallest mountain in the world. Yasuko Namba had stayed quite late on the mountaintop. The date was May 10th, 1996, and it was close to the afternoon. As Yasuko and her team started their journey downward, the weather conditions worsened. Before they could reach their camp, a snowstorm had started. The snowstorm caused a whiteout making it impossible to find the campsite and possibly get shelter. The whole expedition, including Yasuko, was stuck in the storm in the South Coal area of Everest, exposed to the harsh climate, freezing temperatures, and extreme winds. Mike Groom, the guide of the expedition who survived the incident, would later say that Yasuko was trying to put on her oxygen mask during the storm, despite having run out of oxygen already. The situation looked very grim. Namba and her fellow climber Weathers were severely affected by these bad weather conditions, so they had to be assisted with their guides. Eventually, the guides came to the decision that moving towards a campsite in the whiteout and snowstorm was too dangerous. Not only would they be unable to locate the campsite due to poor vision in the whiteout, but they could also get lost or fall down a cliff. The party stopped and decided to wait out the storm. They would be stuck in these conditions for a long time. Anatoly Bukriv, one of Fisher's team guides decided to venture out later during the night to try to look for the missing party members. He helped many of the climbers stuck in the storm. Eventually, he came back to help Sandy Pittman and Tim Madsen, who had been stuck alongside Yasuko in the storm. Weathers was in such bad condition that Madsen decided he would not make it back down to the camp. A rescue attempt for Weathers could have cost the lives of others. When he examined Yasuko, Madsen thought that he was already dead she was left behind in the storm with Weathers. The next day, a search party was organized to find Yasuko and Weathers. At this point, it was very likely that the two were already dead. But when the rescuers reached the place where both climbers had been left behind, the rescuers were surprised to see them still alive. Unfortunately, however, 
Their condition was too critical. Both seemed to be hanging on to life by sheer will. In the current state, it was not wise to attempt a rescue, as they would not make it to the base camp alive. The harsh reality was that there were more survivors at the moment on Everest who had been stuck in the storm, others who may have a much better chance of surviving after being rescued. Another difficult decision was made during the unfortunate tragedy. For the second time, Yasuko and Weather had been left behind. Yasuko Namba, at some point later, died of exhaustion and exposure to the elements. She had fought to the last, but the unforgiving Everest had claimed her life. Her body remained there for now, frozen in time. Weathers, despite all odds, survived. He climbed down to the camp and was saved. However, he lost his nose, right arm, fingers on his other hand, and his toes. The 1996 incident was one of the worst in the history of mountaineering, claiming the life of eight people. Anatoly Bukriv would later be haunted by his regret of not being able to do more to save Yasuko. In 1997, he made the journey to find Yasuko's body. He was successful in locating the body where it had been left. However, he could not retrieve it, so instead, he raised a cairn to protect her body from the scavenger birds. Later in the same year, Yasuko's husband commissioned a party to get Yasuko's body down from her resting place. The expedition was successful and her body was retrieved. Today, two memorial cortins stand near Gorik Shep, one for Yasuko Namba and her team members Doug Hansen and Andy Harris, and the other for Rob Hall, the leader of the expedition. Connecting the two memorials are prayer flags. The story of Yasuko and her expedition would be retold in the movie Into Thin Air, Death on Everest, and Everest. Even today, her determination and achievements inspire climbers from around the world. The circumstances around the death of Gerard McDonnell are very mysterious. Born on 20th January 1971, Gerard was a mountaineering enthusiast. He was a very well-known figure in the Anchorage Irish community and was loved by his fellow Irishmen. During his career as a mountaineer, he summoned a Denali and helped some climbers in trouble to safety on his way down. He was a fourth Irishman to ever summit Mount Everest. He then climbed many unknown peaks of the Askai Chin Plateau. In 2005, he again climbed Denali. With so much climbing experience under his belt, it was now time to try his greatest challenge yet. One of the most dangerous mountains in the world, K2. K2 is an 8,611 meters tall mountain infamous for being extremely difficult to climb. Gerard, however, was determined to take on this difficult challenge. He attempted his first climb in August 2006, but the attempt was cut short by a falling rock which cracked his helmet and fractured his skull. He had to be airlifted out of the mountain and sent to a hospital. He was back in July 2008, ready to make his second attempt at summoning the mountain. But heavy snowfall and strong winds halted the expedition for weeks. Eventually, the weather conditions improved until they were good enough to attempt a climb. There were many other expeditions also waiting to make their attempt at climbing K2. Gerard's expedition and the other expeditions pulled their resources together to attempt the climb as one big group. The climb began, but it would end up being one of the most tragic expeditions in the history of K2. While climbing to the summit, two climbers fell to their death. This was a result of poor coordination among the group. With such a large expedition, it also becomes more dangerous to climb through the bottleneck. The bottleneck of K2 is a narrow couloir with Ciroc's hanging above. This stretch is very steep and is considered to be the most dangerous part of the climb. So, many people climbing through this narrow path really slowed down the expedition as a whole. The death count was already at two. However, 18 climbers, including Gerard, were able to reach K2 summit safely despite these difficulties. With this, Gerard became the first Irish person to climb K2. The delay that had happened during the climb meant that when the party reached K2 summit, it was close to nighttime. The sun was going down fast and precious daylight was being lost. The expedition had to be quicker on their way down. During the descent, another death occurred when the Ciroc fell, killing a climber. Unfortunately, the Ciroc had taken another very important thing with it, the fixed ropes the expedition needed to climb down were now gone. 
Gerard and his group were stuck 8,000 meters above sea level, with immediate rescue being impossible. Accompanying Gerard was his team member, Marco Confortola. Both friends were stuck in this unfortunate situation together. However, they had to take measures to improve their chances of survival. Comfortola dug two pits for them to take shelter. In the freezing temperature, they both were very cold. They spent the night in the makeshift shelters, and in the morning, they tried to make their way down the mountain. During their descent, they came across three Korean climbers who were hanging from the mountain upside down with a cord attached to their waist. Left in that condition, they would die. Gerard and Comfortola, ignoring the most important rule of mountaineering, save your life first, tried to rescue them for three hours, but all their attempts were unsuccessful. In the end, they had to leave the climbers. But as they left the Korean climbers and made their way downwards, suddenly, Gerard turned around. Without saying a word, he started climbing back up. This was extremely strange. Comfortola called for him, but there was no response. This was the last time Comfortola saw his friend alive. He had no choice but to continue his way downwards, fearing for his own life. After a while, he was completely exhausted and slept. His sleep would be disturbed by a rumbling noise. An avalanche was coming down beside him. As the avalanche went past just a few meters away from him, he spotted the body of Gerard. Gerard had died. Confortola will later be rescued and be among the lucky few who survived the tragedy. In total, 11 climbers died during the expedition, making it one of the most deadly incidents in K2's climbing history. It is not clear why Gerard suddenly turned around and climbed back up, ignoring his friend's calls. Some people speculate that the lack of oxygen made Gerard confused, which is why he climbed back up. But a more enduring theory is that he wanted to try to rescue the Korean climbers, no matter the risk of his own life, so he made his way back and died trying to save them. Gerard's body was never found, but there are plaques memorializing him, located on the Gyoki Memorial on K2 and on King Mountain in Alaska. Gerard is remembered by the mountaineering community as a brave hero who gave his life trying to save others. He is an inspiration and a hero for the Irish mountaineering community. Carl Unterkircher is a legend in the mountaineering community. The Italian-born climber held the world record for climbing the two highest peaks on the earth, Mount Everest and K2. In the same year without using supplementary oxygen, he completed both climbs within a 63-day period, cementing his status as one of the best mountaineers in history. Carl Unterkircher also made the second ascent of Mount Genyan, but what he was most known for was climbing new routes for the first time. Most famously, he was the first to climb the north face of Gasherbrum II. He also climbed Jusimba, Nepal with his partner, Hans Kammerlander. With such an impressive career spent climbing new routes of some of the tallest mountains in the world, it was no surprise when Unterkircher announced he would be summoning Nanga Parbat using a new route. Nanga Parbat, often referred to as a king of mountains, is the ninth largest mountain in the world. It is 8,126 meters high, and it is known to be extremely difficult to climb. As a matter of fact, it is dubbed the Killer Mountain because of how dangerous it is to summit. So trying a new route of Nanga Parbat was no small feat. It would take a lot of planning and determination for Unterkircher to achieve his goal. Unterkircher, 38 at the time, started the climb with his fellow team members Walter Nones and Simon Kerr. The route they were trying was a Rakyot wall for summiting Nanga Parbat. Since the group was trying out a new route, added dangers were present. It would be difficult or even impossible for a rescue team to reach them if anything bad happened. Also, there won't be any campsites available during the route. Most importantly, the route is new, so it is not attempted before. This means that unknown dangers could lie along their path. Despite these difficulties, the group set out to create history. The expedition started out pretty well. The group was making good progress. However, things were about to take a dire turn. Mid-expedition, a satellite call was received from Walter Nones and Simon Kerr. They delivered troubling news. At around 21,000 feet of height up on the mountain, Unterkircher had fallen into an ice crevice. The group had been climbing up the mountain, with Unterkircher staying close to his fellow team members. Then suddenly, 
just a few yards away from Nones and Kerr, the snow beneath Unterkirker's feet gave away. He disappeared from the sight of his companions. The snow he was standing on had been covering a large ice crevice. An ice crevice is formed in glaciers as a crack. The crack can be just a few inches wide, or it can be wider than 40 feet. Since an ice crevice is a crack in the snow, the walls are almost completely vertical. Many don't have any surfaces to climb on. The day of the incident was Tuesday. As mentioned before, a rescue attempt would be impossible due to the incident happening away from the main route and high up on the mountain. On this new route, it was on Walter Nones and Simon Kerr to rescue their friend. At the moment, Unterkirker is at the bottom of a very steep 50 feet ice crevice. According to Nones and Kerr, his body is covered in a large amount of snow. The pair would stay and make every effort they could to rescue him. Walter Nones lowered Kerr by rope into the crevice. Kerr then dug out Unterkirker from under the snow, but unfortunately, they did not have the right equipment needed to retrieve him. On Thursday, a rescue party is organized and sent to Nanga Parbat, but the main goal of the party isn't to save Unterkirker. The main goal is to rescue Nones and Kerr, since rescuing Unterkirker seems hopeless. On Wednesday, Nones and Kerr make another satellite call. There is no way to save Unterkirker. They must leave him behind, inside the crevice. The pair cannot descend back the way they came, so their only option is to continue to climb. Staying any longer could further put their lives in danger. They wanted to climb up until they could find a safer route out. The chances of survival seems low. As their satellite phone was almost out of battery power, they made their last call. There's no way to contact them anymore. Thankfully, during a search for the two survivors, the rescuers were able to locate their tent and rescue them. They had made it out of this unfortunate experience alive, yet without their dear friend. In the end, Unterkirker was presumed dead. His body was never retrieved. He died doing what he loved, exploring new routes to the summits of the world's tallest mountains. One of the saddest tragedies in the history of mountaineering is the death of Jean-Christophe Lafayette. Lafayette was a French climber known as a mountaineering prodigy. From a young age, he climbed Seuss multiple times, helping make it popular as a climbing venue. Afterwards, he moved on to greater adventures. Lafayette made various difficult climbs on Mont Blanc. He was also invited to an expedition of Vanaparnu by Pierre Bellin. However, during the climb, Pierre Bellin fell to his death. Since the expedition only consisted of the two climbers, Lafayette was left on his own on one of the most difficult points in the climbs. Here, the unmatched skills of Lafayette came in handy, and with his great agility, he climbed down a 75-degree cliff. Then, while trying to save himself, he broke his arm, but after several arduous days, he was able to get himself to safety. After a long break due to his incident, Lafayette began climbing again, making attempts at Cho Oyu, Gashabrum 1, Gashabrum 2, and Manaslu. But his great feat was yet to come when he chose to attempt the climb of Makalu. Makalu is the fifth greatest mountain in the world, standing at 8,481 meters. In December 2005, Lafayette decided to make a solo ascent of Makalu. This was a very bold undertaking since Makalu is one of the hardest mounts to climb solo. At the time, such a climb was considered suicidal since no one thought that a person could do it all alone, especially in the winter. But Lafayette was not about to be put off by the danger. He was determined to make the ascent of Makalu and be the first one to climb it alone in the winter. Not only that, but he was also going to attempt the climb without oxygen. At the time, he was 40 years old. Lafayette began his ascent from base camp, laboring against a rough terrain in the arduous climb. After making his advanced base camp, hauling heavy loads high up the mountain, he was making decent progress, but the weather conditions worsened a lot during this time. By the time he reached the coal at Makalu La, the wind had gotten extremely strong, so much so that his tent was completely destroyed. He himself was blown away twice, but somehow remained uninjured. Lafayette had no choice but to retreat back to safety. Once back at the camp, he had to wait for the weather to clear up once again so he could continue the ascent of Makalu alone. Two weeks would go by before the weather improved enough for Lafayette to continue the climb. On 24 January, he set off again. 
Ready to make it to the summit this time around, he was once again able to make good progress. On the 27th, he had his camp made just 1,000 meters before the summit. He was so close to reaching the peak, he had pitched his camp on a small ledge. On either side of the camp were slopes filled with rocks and snow going down into the deep valleys of the Himalayas. Above him was nothing but the summit looming high up. He was now ready to make the final climb. A successful summit would have made history. However, the adventure of Lafayette was about to come to a quick saddening end. Throughout the ascent, Lafayette had been in contact with his wife Kasha using a satellite phone. It was his one comfort during the highs and lows of the expedition. In the morning, he again made contact with his wife, telling her he was up and moving and he would try to reach the summit that day. Then he started to make preparation for the upcoming ascent. He ate, put on his gear, and took all the necessary provisions. Before leaving, he called his wife again. This would be the last time he was heard of ever again. The climb to the summit would have taken hours upon hours of continuous climbing, so the next communication was expected to happen quite a while later. But no matter how much time passed, no call came through. Lafayette had disappeared. Unfortunately, it was a wish of Lafayette to be alone on his expeditions coming true that led to the inability of a rescue attempt to be made. There were no rope mates, porters, or climbers with him. Plus, at the moment, there happened to be no climber around who was sufficiently acclimatized to reach the altitude at which Lafayette had gone missing. Additionally, there were no other expeditions nearby either. The base camp gave up on rescuing Lafayette after one week of his disappearance. A helicopter flight was later conducted to try and spot his body, but there was no success. In the end, the body of Lafayette was never found. Although Lafayette's fate is unknown, at least he passed away doing what he loved. Attempting a climb alone with only the cliffs, mountains, and valleys that he loved so much surrounding him. Lafayette is succeeded by his wife Kasia and his three children. Serge Dussuralt was a captain of Montreal's fire department with a passion for mountaineering. Serge was known by his friends and family to be a very careful and experienced climber. Although he had made several ascents before, this time around, his venture was a treacherous K2. K2 is the second tallest mountain in the world, but it may be the deadliest mountain to climb in the world as well. Standing at 8,611 meters, this giant has some of the most difficult climbing sections that tests the resolve of even the most experienced mountaineers. Plus, K2 is known for being very inhospitable. The weather is usually very bad, resulting in dangerous environmental hazards, such as thick snow and strong winds posing a constant danger for the climbers. Serge had a pass with K2. He had previously tried to join an expedition to summit K2 in 2016. However, the notoriously bad weather of K2 resulted in the cancellation of the expedition. So in 2018, Serge was once again ready to take on this great undertaking. He would be leading an expedition of his own. The members of his team included Natalie Fortin, Benoît Lamaru, and Maurice Bazajour. But before the main climb could begin to summit K2, the team needed to acclimatize themselves to the extreme heights they would be climbing. For this, they intended to spend a night at Camp 2 of K2. The ascent to Camp 2 was going well, and the morale was high. The team made quick progress and reached Camp 1 from the base camp. Soon, they also reached Camp 2. Here, as planned, they spent the night so their bodies could acclimatize to the higher altitudes. So far, the journey had been going very well. In the morning, it was time for the expedition to make its way down the mountain, but the tragedy would strike at this time. The plan was to climb back down to base camp and wait for suitable weather conditions to summit K2. With this, Serge would have become the first climber from his providence to summit K2 at the age of 53. But first, the descent to the base camp had to be made. Serge decided to make his way down 30 minutes before his partner Fortin. However, it seemed this descent would end in a calamity for Serge. As he was making his way downwards, suddenly he fell. Serge was an experienced climber who was very careful during his climbs. So such a thing for all intents and purposes shouldn't have happened. But unfortunately, this tragedy had indeed occurred. The fall proved fatal for Serge. He died very soon afterwards. His body was found by his fellow team member in a high porter. Even his fellow climbers seemed unsure about the reason behind the fall with 410, saying, 
We don't know what happened, but the fall was fatal. It's very difficult here. I keep thinking about the close family I know. It's terrible. Although the grief lay heavy on their heart, the body of Serge had to be retrieved so it could be laid to rest. The retrieval was successful and the body was sent to advanced base camp. From there, it was taken to Islamabad. There has been a lot of speculation about what could have caused the fall of Serge. What is known is that Serge fell near Camp 2. According to Dawa Sherpa, Serge had fallen from House's chimney. House's chimney is a crack in a rock wall of K2, which is part of the normal route used by climbers during their ascent to the summit. The nearby Sherpas also said that the fall was caused by Serge clipping onto one of the older ropes. On various parts of K2, there are nets of old ropes that have been left there. Since these ropes have been exposed to the harsh climate and temperature of K2, they are usually considered to be unstable, prone to snapping or coming loose, hence why most climbers avoid clipping onto them while climbing. It is possible that by accident or by thinking that the old rope was stable enough for bearing his weight, Serge had clipped onto one during his descent. The rope gave away, sending Serge plummeting down the mountain. However, the exact reason behind the fall cannot be known. The house's chimney is also a very difficult part to climb up or down, even though it is located at a pretty low altitude. Whatever the reason may be, the death of Serge was a great loss for the mountaineering community and his family. He was well loved at his fire department. In his remembrance, the flags of his fire station in Dusseralt were flown at half staff. His photo was also placed at the door. The expedition that Serge was leading was cancelled after the loss of his life. Although most deaths in the mountains are of hobbyists and professional climbers, sometimes the casualties occur for people trying to do their job. Gordon Henderson was a wing commander in the RAF, the United Kingdom's Royal Air Force. A father of two, Gordon was part of an expedition with the intent of climbing the length of the Baltoro Glacier conducted. Afterward, they were to visit the Broad Peak and K2 base camps and then ascend to Gondogorola Pass. The expedition was successful in climbing through Baltoro Glacier. However, it was during their ascent of Broad Peak that an unfortunate incident happened to Gordon. Broad Peak is the 12th highest mountain in the world at 8,051 meters and Gordon and his team were tasked with climbing its summit. Broad Peak is a very difficult and dangerous climb. However, despite these difficulties, Gordon and his team were ready to take on the challenge. Their ascent was going very well. There were no significant incidents during the climb and the weather was also on their side for most of the climb. The expedition reached all the way up only 39 feet from the summit. The goal of this mission was so close at hand. All that was left to do was to climb over the crest and head to the top. With Gordon was Mr. Casanelli, a mountain guide and a climber who was there to summit Broad Peak as well. Unknown to either of them, something very unfortunate was about to happen and Casanelli would be the witness to the whole incident about to occur. As both climbers were there, ready to take on the last few obstacles in their way, they looked at each other. Mr. Casanelli gave the nod to Gordon indicating he should be the first one to start climbing over the crest. A show of courtesy from one climber to another. What happened next shook Mr. Casanelli to his core. Gordon was wearing a rucksack on his back. After seeing the nod, he turned around to begin his ascent. Gordon was only about to take one step forward when his rucksack struck against rock face of the mountain. This was enough to throw him off balance. He slid just for a moment and then he was gone. Gordon had fallen head first down the steep cliff of Broad Peak. Not a cry or a sound escaped Gordon's mouth as he slipped. This silent tragedy stopped Casanelli dead in his tracks. He couldn't do anything but stare in horror. It seemed he had lost all his senses. According to Casanelli, he was speechless, rooted to the spot. He stayed immobile for quite a while, clutching his ice axe with his crampons planted in the ice and snow. However, soon, Casanelli came back to his senses. Although he was so close, he abandoned all attempts at making a climb to the summit. Instead, he immediately started making his way back down to Camp 3, which was the closest climbing camp to his position. Once he reached the camp and informed his colleagues of Henderson about what had happened, they wanted to ensure that he had actually seen Gordon and not someone else. So they showed Casanelli one of the pictures of Gordon Casanelli confirmed that that was a person he had seen fall. This incident showed 
that when mountaineering at such great heights and under such difficult conditions, even a small misstep can result in tragedy. Gordon only had his rucksack get caught on some rocks, and the unforgiving terrain of Broad Peak claimed his life. A fall from such a steep cliff certainly meant death. Also, since he had fallen head first, the chances of survival were near zero. Soon after the incident, Gordon was declared missing and probably dead. It is chilling to think that if Casanelli had not been there to witness the incident, the disappearance of Gordon would have probably gone unresolved. The RAF made a statement regarding the event, saying they were deeply saddened to announce that Wing Commander Gordon Henderson is reported missing, believed killed on Broad Peak, Pakistan. Our thoughts and prayers are with his family. Gordon Henderson was a veteran soldier. He had served in Afghanistan for his country. He studied at Harriet Watt University. Gordon Henderson left behind two children and his wife, Carrie.